This is the 10 Minute Teacher Podcast with your host, Vicki Davis. It's back to school, and educators, you can get your free educator wellness toolkit from today's sponsor, Advancement Courses. Stay tuned at the end of the show to learn how to register for your free kit and how to receive 20% off your next advancement course. Today, I'm so excited. We're talking with Roberta Freitas. She is from Ibeo School in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And I first was introduced to Roberta as she presented at ISTE. I couldn't attend ISTE this year in person, so I attended online and hers was an incredible presentation I attended on AI in the classroom. Roberta, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited. Roberta, let's talk about how are you using AI in the classroom? So I first was not introduced, but the first time I thought of AI in the classroom was on AST last year. I realized the importance of getting our students acquainted with AI and how much it is embedded into our daily lives. It's closer than we even think. So I started thinking how we could do it, how we could bring this. We are a language school. We teach English for these students. I started to think how we could bring those two things together, like English and AI, and we started developing activities for teachers. I'm a coordinator, so part of my job is helping teachers start using new technology and new kinds of tools. So at first, I start preparing activities for them because it's easier if they have something ready because, of course, they can adapt, and I want them to adapt to their students' realities. But we got some activities ready for them where they experiment some kind of machine learning or an AI experiment. They take a look at algorithms and they discuss with their peers, understand how it works and play a little bit with AI. In your presentation, you talk about this AI experiment. Explain what an AI experiment is and give us an example or two. So Google has this page full of AI experiments that you can try. And so you have like the teachable machine, which is an experiment of machine learning. So you can teach this machine, whatever it is you want this machine to learn. So you input images and then you train the machine to understand what the output should be. So I could train the machine to recognize if I'm wearing a mask or not. So I input lots of images of me wearing a mask and I say masked and the output could be a GIF, a sound or the speech. And and then I do the same without a mask and you get lots of inputs, lots of images from different angles and then the experiment is ready. You can even get a video of that. So students could train this machine to do anything. So they could use it to solve someone else's problem, create like dealing with empathy, try to create something, a device that could make someone else's life easier or something like that. Another experiment, there is one which is called shadow art and it deals with the signs of the Chinese zodiac. So there are lots of animals and this is one we use a lot with kids because then they have, doing the shadows with their hands, they have to recreate the animal. So it's a really fun experiment to get kids to start understanding AI. So as your students, for example, when you train it with the pictures, as they're doing these experiments, obviously when you have an experiment, you're trying something out and then you're making observations. How does that coaching process or that conversation work between teachers and students? So what I like when I think of an activity, I like to think that first they're going to talk a little bit about AI or specifically machine learning or algorithm, whatever aspect of AI they're going to deal with. And then they're going to tinker, play with it, experiment a little bit to understand. Then they're going to reflect on that experience. So how did it go? What went well? What was hard? What can machines do? What can't they do very well? And then they will, I don't know, create a prototype or think of improvements there could be on this experiment or something like that. So I always try to have this process for teachers so that they don't just stay like 
experimenting thing. They go deeper into that. The challenge, and this is just an ethical issue that I talk to my students about with artificial intelligence, is that it's only as good as the feedback that it gets from humans. And so many of the AI tools you probably know about and that I learned out about ISTE don't really give you a method for feedback. I'll give you an example. There's this thing called verse by verse, which you probably know about where the famous poets of history, some of them help coach you in writing a poem. So last week when I found out about it, I wrote a poem that As I was in this session and listening, someone pointed out there's not much diversity in these poets. Well, I looked on the page and there was no place to report that or say, you've got a flaw in your AI because you've not programmed enough diversity in your poets that you've used. And there was no way to give feedback. So what do we talk about that angle of things? Yeah, and this is... One of the reasons why I think it's so important for us to teach AI in the classroom or talk about AI in the classroom, because there is a huge problem of diversity and bias with AI. So we need these students to understand also the limits of AI, understand that there are bias. And so whenever they see they have to be critical of what they are dealing with, the AI they are dealing with, because it really is an issue. And you're right, I don't see a place for feedback on any of the AI experiments or things like that. So I think we need to get students to think about that and students who belong to different races or social classes, they need to understand that they have to be part of it because that's it. Humans are the ones who are training. And nowadays, most of the humans who are doing it are probably white, rich people who have more access to technology And those are the first ones to get there, to get these opportunities. And we need to have everybody, all kinds of people, all kinds of classes and genders. We need to have everybody on this so that we have different kinds of points of view, right? Yes. And let's talk about some other AI apps that you like to use in experiments. And let's just mention those. And I'll try to include those in the show notes because It really is a little bit mind-blowing when you start playing with these tools. I like to use like daily apps like YouTube, for example. So understanding how the algorithm, YouTube and other social networks, how does the algorithm work? So what kinds of recommendations are you getting, suggestions from the app are you getting, and why do you get those? Students also have to understand that they can create their own algorithm As they interact with different people, different accounts, they comment, they like, they are creating this algorithm. So they need to understand how it works because whatever shows up when they watch a video, so there is a recommendation afterwards, that's not like out of the bloom. That happens because of the things they are interacting with. Also on Spotify or Netflix, all the kinds of recommendations, recommendations on what you should watch next on Netflix. Why do you get that? Because of the things, the similar other shows that you have watched. So I really like to use these things that they, these apps that they use on a daily basis. And also voice assistants like Alexa, Siri, Google Home, to understand how they interact with that. For us here in Brazil, voice assistants are really interesting because at first, when they first showed up, they would only speak English. So there was no Portuguese on Alexa, for example. It was only English. And it's quite interesting to see the evolution of the assistant. Because like my husband, he's a learner of English. He's not totally proficient, but he's been improving. He's been taking classes. And when he first talked to it, it was very hard for Alexa to understand the way he was speaking, because he wouldn't make like a full question. Question formation for us in Portuguese is different than in English, like the order. So when he was trying to ask questions, it was not perfect. And many times Alexa would not understand. But then with the evolution of Alexa, she started understanding even when the question was not made correctly. So it's quite interesting to see this development, right? At first, your language would have to be the the pattern language. And then some changes there, some machine learning went on or something like that. The other problem with algorithms is there doesn't seem to be an undo button. 
if you accidentally watch a video or listen to music that you don't, or you were curious or whatever, it's almost impossible to undo that impact. And then you start getting a whole slew of information. I'll never forget, I talked to a teacher from Jordan and he had a lot of Syrian refugees coming into his classroom. And at the time, this just terrible, those terrible beheadings were happening and were being posted to YouTube from Syria. And he said the problem he had was that his kids were still in the war zone, that because of the algorithms of YouTube, that his kids could not leave Syria and the trauma that was happening daily, that they could not separate the kids from the trauma because they logged into their Google accounts and they couldn't break the algorithms in YouTube from showing them what was going on in Syria. And this conversation we had it's been a good five or six years ago, but it's still just stuck with me of if you're intervening and trying to help a child with an eating disorder, you really need to intervene and help break the algorithm. But there's no method to do that unless they start completely over. There is no undo button, as you mentioned. What you can do is start liking and commenting and interacting with things that are more relatable to you, things that you like or that you, you would like to be seeing to try to teach the algorithm the things that make sense to you but other things really there's no undo button there's nothing like no I don't want to see this anymore it's going to keep showing for some time and depending on location that's very hard right the things that will show to you I highly recommend Roberta's session, Roberta Freitas, if you purchase, purchase the ISTE where you can attend and watch for longer like I, I can. Go back and take a look at her session. It was excellent. This whole idea of AI experiments, I think, should become part of every computer applications and definitely every computer science. As we make theories, we have conversations, we test the AI, and perhaps we could even use different accounts to test the AI that's going on behind the scenes because we have to train all of this that's surrounding us. And it seems to me that we sort of release these algorithms into the wild and nobody's taming them and nobody's giving feedback. And there's just a lot. It's the wild west of AI and a lot needs to change. And Roberta, it's your kind of thinking that is pushing us towards helping kids understand what's going on. It's artificial intelligence. It doesn't have a morals, ethics. Any of that has to come from us. And then we need to start having those conversations. Anything you want to add, Roberta? I just want to add that we don't want students to be victims of AI. So this is why it's so important. They can be protagonists on this and trying to change this story, change the algorithm and change AI and bring the good side of it because there are lots of benefits in it. For sure. Thank you for coming on the show, Roberta. Go to coolcatteacher.com forward slash wellness and download your free educator wellness toolkit from today's sponsor, Ed Advancement Courses. You'll get access to activities, strategies, and tools to improve the four domains of wellness. Also, right now, you can save 20% off your next course by using the code CAT20. Yes, that's C-A-T-20, just for our listeners and readers of the Cool Cat Teacher blog. I love their courses because they are flexible with up to six months to complete and you can receive graduate credit through CAEP and regionally accredited university partners or continuing education units that meet your state requirement like I did. With over 280 courses to choose from, Advancement Courses offer subjects in everything from educator wellness to social emotional learning and more. You've been listening to the 10 Minute Teacher Podcast. If you like this program, you can find more at CoolCatTeacher.com. If you wish to see more content by Vicki Davis, you can find her on Facebook and Twitter under CoolCatTeacher. Thank you for listening.